The Senator from Delaware. Mr. President, are we in a quorum call? We are not. Mr. President, I rise today to join with my colleague, the Senator from Alaska, in celebrating some good news. Every now and then, something really good happens here in the Congress of the United States. Many of us know the story of ALS, a particularly cruel and brutal disease, a disease that attacks the body but not the mind, and whose victims, while they steadily lose their ability to control their muscles and their movement, suffer a sort of living death that until you have seen it up close, it is hard to appreciate just how cruel this disease is. And Mr. President, last week, 423 of our House colleagues, members of the House of Representatives, voted to send the Act for ALS Act here to this Senate. And last night, we here in the Senate unanimously sent that bill to President Biden's desk for his signature. I have to start, I want to start, by thanking my dear friend and colleague, the Senator from Alaska. She has been a tireless, passionate, capable advocate, and without her, this would not have happened. For those who question whether bipartisanship can still deliver results that matter, this senator, this bill, this moment proves that it can and it does. We're grateful to our lead co-sponsors over in the House, Congressman Quigley and Congressman Fortenberry, but frankly, the story behind this moment is the incredible advocacy of the ALS community. They are the reason that the bill got drafted, the bill got introduced, the bill got marked up, the bill passed the House, and that here in the Senate some obstructions were overcome with remarkable force and swiftness. I'm just briefly going to mention the tenacity and the strength and the capability of some of the folks who've been my role models in this work, and then I'm going to yield to my friend and colleague from Alaska, and she'll also speak about it. I just do also briefly want to say that Act for ALS is not just some resolution. It's not just some commemorative act. This will deliver $100 million through a newly authorized FDA rare neurodegenerative disease grant program. It will fund critical research. It will improve coordination between the federal, academic, and private sector researchers. And more than anything else, it will give people hope. Um, when I think of this work, Dan Tate is the man who first comes to mind. And uh, Dan, uh, like me, is a graduate of Amherst College and a spirited and capable and soulful person, um, one of Washington's most skilled lobbyists, um, someone who worked in the Clinton administration and uh, worked for a member of the House and his personal advocacy has meant a huge amount to me, um, as has the engagement by Brian Wallach and so many others. And I have a half dozen other folks of whom I want to speak, but first I think simple decency suggests I should yield the floor to my friend and colleague from Alaska. Senator. Mr. President. The Senator from Alaska. Mr. President. As, as my friend from Connecticut has, has pointed out, there are... Oh, my goodness, my soul. <laughs> Mr. President, may I strike that erroneous introduction? Stricken. To thank, to thank my dear friend from Delaware, always Delaware, uh, but truly a friend a friend um, uh, on many different issues, but, but a man who I have come to know is, is motivated not by the politics of what goes on in this body, but, but by the passion uh, and his interest in doing good, doing good policy and doing good things for people. And, and what we are speaking to today, recognizing the, the significant passage of the Act for ALS Act happened last evening unanimously, as he has pointed out, that this is, this is not only 
this is not only good for for the body, if you will, to, to say we were able to move good legislation forward, good policy legislation forward. But this is, this is a gift. This is a gift of hope for those who live with ALS, for those families who are part of that journey of those who live with ALS. ALS, as Senator Coons has noted, is an awful, awful disease. Some would suggest, and I certainly would, that it is probably the worst, the worst disease to be afflicted with. When your body literally closes in on you while your mind is still active and vibrant. I have a very personal connection to ALS. I think many of us have very personal connections to ALS. I don't like the fact. Will the senator suspend? Can we, can we have a little quieter? Maybe the discussion can leave the well. Thank you, Mr. President. I wish that we didn't have these personal connections to this hideous disease, but we do. And that connection allows us to learn and understand a little bit more about it. And I think the most heartbreaking thing that I realized when my family member was diagnosed with ALS, my cousin's husband, was that there was no treatment. There was no hope. There was no hope. I'm not suggesting that the act for ALS is the end-all, be-all. I wish that we could stand here and say that. It is not. But what it is, is a glimmer of hope. I, uh, I want to read just a couple sentences from an email that I received last evening when I was able to share this good news that this bill was passing unanimously through this body. And my cousin Jen says, the passage of this bill will bring real, tangible hope to people living with ALS and those to be diagnosed. In this ALS world right now, there are no effective treatments. All we have is hope. This bill changes everything. It will bring real, tangible hope and treatments to people living with ALS. We've never had that in this disease. We haven't found the cure. We haven't found the treatment. But what we are providing today is that first step forward, a tangible step forward to the hope. Because every day, every day, those who are living with ALS and their loved ones who live through this disease with them have to hope and pray every single day that today is going to be the day. Today is going to be the day that we can slow this, that we can halt this. Mr. President, there are some extraordinary heroes that have been involved with this fight over the years. They're everyday people. They got into it not because they were paid lobbyists, most of them got into it because they had lived through ALS. They had lost a loved one to this disease. And, and rather than to give up and give in and be too tired to carry on, they said, I'm going to commit so that no, no other families have to feel this helplessness. And so you've got, you've got some amazing people. You've got a... You've got a group out there, the IMALS team, extraordinary, extraordinary advocates. Senator Coons has mentioned uh, Brian Wallach and Dan Tate. Uh, the two of them led, I, lead IMALS. You've got Megan Miller, Deb Pouse, Sandy Morris, Krista Thompson, Nicole Simbura, Becky Mori, Michael Lecker, Shelley Hoover, Michelle Lorenz, Mayuri, 
uh, and Mayank uh, Saxena, so many, so many more who were part of, of that effort. The IM ALS organization working with the ALS Association, working with the Muscular Dystrophy Association, so many others who were so critical in moving this forward. Think about what happened. This was introduced over here in the Senate. We looked this up. It was May 25th. May 25th. And to get over 60 co-sponsors in the United States Senate on any kind of a measure, I wish that the senator from Delaware and I could say that we single-handedly got every single one of those co-sponsors. But it was these advocates, it was these grassroots individuals, it was, it was, it was everybody that I just named, Dan and Megan and, and Jenny and Deb and Sandy, who made these calls, who were relentless. And when the politics did intervene, they were unleashed and passionate in their advocacy. And I think this is a good lesson to us, that, that, that when, when those who are, are intimately and passionately involved, that you can make a difference. You can, you can move legislation. You can move mountains. Um, last thing I want to say before I, I turn back to my colleague here, uh, there's a lot of people who, who are not part of an organization, but who have just felt compelled to, to speak up. We heard voices from around my state. Um, Marcel uh, was from Sitka. Douglas from Anchorage, a, a gentleman by the name of Mike also from Anchorage. The calls, the letters, the emails that we got, I know all of our colleagues received the same as well. So this, this again, was an effort that was so personal to, to so many. But the leadership that I think we saw come together with Brian Wallach, his wife Sandra, um, they, they were the founders there of I Am ALS. Brian was only 37 years old when he was diagnosed with ALS, 37, so super young. And he was told, six months, you've got six months to live. He is a father to two little girls, and he just said, we gotta keep fighting. We gotta keep fighting for a cure, a cure that will allow him to raise his daughters uh, with his wife. And I think it's fair to say that four years later now, Brian is just as determined, just as tireless an advocate for ALS and the ALS community. Uh, so again, I think about people like Brian and Dan, my cousin Jenny, um, who lost Pat to this awful disease in, in, in 2013. He'd lived, he'd lived with ALS for eight years. Our family lived with ALS for those eight years. And so the advocacy continues because, because of the passion for so many who have lived, lived through a lived through a life that is almost difficult for us to imagine. And as they have, as they have come out uh, of losing a loved one to a disease like this, to know that they are willing to carry that flag, that they are willing to commit their time, their resources, and everything that they have so that others don't go through this. We honor them. We honor that commitment. I am, I'm just so pleased to be able to, to work with my partner on this um, and, and to know that this was a good success, but we're going to need to be doing more, and I'll be doing it with him. That, Mr. President, I, I yield to my, my friend from Delaware. Thank you, Mr. President. I want to express my gratitude to my friend and colleague from Alaska. It is indeed a deep well of darkness into which a family is cast when they receive a diagnosis of ALS. And my own awareness of this disease and its dread consequences um, is rooted in a number of cases um, that came to me and my extended family now quite a few years ago. Uh, 
my brother is with us here in the chamber today, and his dear friend, Dan Loftus, passed through ALS. And I remember the pain that this caused him and the depth of that loss. A friend of mine from Delaware, Alex Snyder Mackler, first shared with me his father, Scott's diagnosis with ALS now 20 years ago. And year after year, as many of us would gather in Newark and run a 5K and do a fundraiser for some sort of research, for some sort of hope, his father, Scott, slowly slipped away. I talked to Alex this morning and was reminded of how much this means to those families who've come through this. Max Walton, a dear friend of mine in the bar in Delaware, his father, just an unbelievable character, a great and funny and creative and capable man who built a family business and then slipped from us through ALS. ALS was first known to America when Lou Gehrig, an outstanding baseball player, got it, and he is still famous for his I'm the luckiest man in the world speech when he announced his retirement from baseball. But 80 years later, 80 years later, it is still a mystery to science and a death sentence to those who get this dread diagnosis, often told they have just a few short years to live. This bill, in their name and honor, confronts this stark reality and makes progress. I cannot close without thanking two other people. Megan Tyra, who is tireless here on the floor in helping move and prioritize things, working for Leader Schumer, who lost her own mother, Ellen Tyra, to ALS. Uh, and last, if I could, for someone who I am not, uh, I'm not worthy of. Um, I have a legislative director, uh, Brian Winsick, who is a spectacular human being, whose skill and persistence and diligence and dedication for my side of this kept us at it every day. His father, Joseph, was a high school civics teacher. And the loss of his life through ALS is something of which Brian has made so much good for others through his role in helping shepherd this through my office. What Senator Murkowski and I are showing for a moment here today is an answer to a question so many families, so many people living with ALS, so many who have lost a loved one to ALS wonder in the dark moments, does anyone care? Does anyone see this? Does anyone know what's happening? Is anyone going to do something about this? The families and those who are living today with ALS and those who have lost someone to ALS need to know that your advocacy is heard, that it moved a mountain here in the Congress, and it will begin moving resources and energy and dedication. We are at the beginning of the next step of this journey. But as my dear friend, under whom I served many, many years ago in a very dark time in the history of South Africa, said, hope, hope is being able to see that despite all the darkness, there is still light. Bishop Desmond Tutu spoke that to the people of South Africa struggling in a very dark time and place. And to the families, the survivors, and those who are living with ALS, my dear friend from Alaska and I, and the folks in our families, and in our staff, and in the many countless teams of advocates around this country, hope that this holiday season, that this Christmas, that this year, we have brought you some glimmer of the light that you have brought to us. Thank you. And with that, I yield the floor and suggest the absence of a quorum.